Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Today we have with us retired Judge Sandra Sims and scholar Ray Dean Kahi Olalo and noted criminal defense attorney and husband of one of our most gifted musical artists, Raya Taya Helm, Bill Harrison. Sandra, Ray Dean, Bill, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. These Happy are to strange here. times. Um, yes. They are indeed. So let me start with a question that may be central one for all of us right now. How do you get grounded and centered in these times with the barrage of what's coming down on us? Ooh, that's a good one because I certainly I've been working at it because it's it's at a place where you kind of wake up each day and it's like oh my god what next and and how do I deal with that to be honest I've been doing a lot of meditating mm. and just kind of sitting quietly stealing myself and and kind of that's one way for me um is sort of grounding in meditation it doesn't take away all the issues but it sure helps you to focus and see things a little differently. And uh, that's one way, method. I don't know. Mm -hmm. others, I found it just kind of getting out and walking, just getting out, getting some air. I take the dog out more often than I used. I used to think, oh, I don't need to walk. But now it's like, it's a time of just kind of peace and collecting, just getting some air. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. It's a really good insight. A friend of mine who was a radiation oncologist for many years at Queens and dealt with some pretty tragic and difficult cases and tried to help people through that. And he formed and led meditation groups for a long time. And I asked him, if you were gonna to explain to somebody in plain language of any age, old or young, what's meditation? He said, you know, maybe it's just trying to figure out what you want to hold on to and what you want to let go of. Mm. And the breathing and the peace and the calm help you do that. Mm -hmm. But that's your transcendence. That's how you elevate the spirit to where it needs to go. How do you do that in these times? Radine, what works for you? I, I think for me, it, you know, I, I agree with Sandra. I think being still in the midst of chaos is really key for me. And it's hard to do. I, th I think um, in these times where there's so much information and of course we want to know what's going on and I do. And uh, sometimes that just traps me in this kind of cycle of, um, you know, not being able to step out of it. So a lot of times it's a matter of just shutting down the computer and mm -hmm. you know not being on social media. But for me, I find my solace in the ocean. You know, yeah. I can go in the ocean and stay there literally for hours. And uh, just something about the environment mm -hmm. and the beauty of it um, tends to center me. And then also prayer, a lot of prayer. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm -hmm. Bill, what works for you? You know, similarly, um, I, I just fall back on my religion. Um, you know, I understand that, that God is there, that everything is his will. Um, and we have been connected with our, with our um, Christian family. Uh, we do a lot of Bible study together. We have a one e evening a week uh, separately. My wife and I do a Bible study together. And um, clearly that helps us uh, to understand to uh, rely on us and support on someone who's not here, someone who controls everything that's here. And so that's basically where we go uh, when we need, um, you know, some kind of reassurance in this difficult time. And, um, you know, my wife is unplugged from this, from social media. She's taken herself off of you know, the Facebooks and the other types of social media. That unplugging for her is very important. Um, so uh, that's where we get our uh, solace from. Mm -hmm. And these have to be especially hard times for someone like Rayatea in the music industry, which is completely shut down. Music, entertainment, art generally. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it, you know, it, it is in, in some respects, but but she she's um, sort of changed her focus in life and uh, she's involved with the Liliokalani Trust uh, and working with them. She's gone back to school. Uh, and this, this virtual learning may be a bit of a, a test for her, but um, she's doing well in that respect. So she's working on finishing up her uh, her um, you know degree and um, working towards uh, the uh, the children in the trust. So she's got a focus in that regard, and then she's also working on the musical side, the cultural side as well uh, in the background, and um, not so much performing because you can't perform unless virtually these days. But more or less maybe writing and um, putting together programs that she suspects will uh, help the kids in the future uh, go on a path that she's been on. So she's very busy. She, she's busier than I am. That's good. I, I think the arts are probably another way in which we can address how we get through this. I know for me, um, I'm not a, a singer or a writer of, of music, but I certainly enjoy it. And I find a lot of solace, um, you know, in, in, in music. And I can see where those that have that skill or have that ability can actually more easily adapt to these times because some of the best music, when we think about it, you know, kind of comes out of these difficult times because, you know, artists have that ability to tap into, you know, social conscious and tap into society and tap and feel things and express in a way that, you know, the rest of us can always do. And that is all, to me, that's, that's always a big plus is to, you know, get some good music and sit back and calm my mind, steal the mind, take out all, all this stuff and, and then, you know, get ready to come back and do it again because we gotta keep, we gotta keep going. We gotta keep pushing forward. And the way to do that is to kind of take care of yourself as well first. So before you get out, I know my daughter's doing a lot of the, what we call a self-care programs. She's been consulting with a lot of agencies, including Lily Okalani Trust, I think, doing things with regard to self-care. Yeah. And so she's, she's a big one. It's like, mom, what are you doing to take care of yourself? <sighs> Leave me alone. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, I'm no, just kidding. But, <laughs> no. but, you know, she's, that's, that's an important thing, particularly for those of, of us and particularly you guys that are kind of on the front lines of having to deal with all the stressful issues in, in our world, uh, people on the, on the medical end, on the front lines, and certainly in the legal and political communities and well and so it's you got to take care of yourself first before you can change the world mm -hmm. true yeah and i think that brings up a really important point which is i've been at a couple of presentations recently on what's called vicarious trauma the mm -hmm. indirect impact of it which we're all experiencing it may be that we're close to someone who experiences a severe health crisis or loses job, mm -hmm. work, income, all those things, impact that they can't control on their life that affects everybody around them. Kids trying to adapt to, how do you learn in this session? I was watching a teacher last night talking about trying to rebuild a different kind of collaborative learning among students is almost starting over from square one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely a heightened sense of anxiety that's global and we're all affecting each other with the way that we are responding to the issues. And, you know, I, I think about, you, you know, we mentioned our leaders and I look at the leaders now, and a lot of times I look at the uh, Hawaii Senate, and I think, how are they doing this? They seem like they're running on fumes. And how can you possibly um, lead in a healthy way if you're running on empty? Yeah. You know, and we've seen that. Three of the leading major center of the storm departmental heads have left recently it's it's just nobody's prepared for this nobody's able to manage or control it right. and it's easy to sit back and be really critical mm -hmm. of people in leadership positions whether it's the governor or the director of the department of health or whoever 
<clears throat> DOE, whoever. But I don't see people stepping up to volunteer to say, we'll share that load with you. We'll mm -hmm. take on some mm -hmm. of that responsibility. Um, I also think, you know, I've been thinking about this and I, you know, that saying, if you um, don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And, and I really have been thinking a lot about how that does tie into leadership. And I think part of not taking care of ourselves, either as citizens or as leaders, is that inability to just anchor yourself and take a stand on something amidst all the voices. I mean, I think the decisions that are being made are probably because there's too many voices that are being listened to. Um, I, you know, and I just feel like leaders do need to take a stand. And that is part of taking care of themselves and the people that they lead. Yeah, and that's a really good point because those voices right now are not reassuring. They're loud, they're destructive, they're threatening, they're intimidating, yes. they're fear generating. Yes. So what, what do you hold on to? What anchors you in ways that help get through that storm? You know, I, I, I actually am in line with Bill. It's, it's my faith, my faith in Christ. It's, you know, knowing that um, where my hope lies ultimately, um, and, and yet still understanding that I have a duty to act every day um, in ways that will make contributions that are hopefully better for the world. Um, but my anchor really is in my faith, you know, um, for whatever reason, I can be in complete turmoil, but I go there and I, I have a peace, a peace that kind of disables all the anxiety inside of me. You know, I think that's a really good focal point, Radine, because all four of us are in service professions, occupations, avocations. Right. Our value is value to other people. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that's true in our personal lives as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so how do you make yourself of value to others in these times? You know, when you were both were talking about, you know, your faith, and that was kind of where I was coming from too when I was talking about the meditation. But what is key, I think, for each of us, all of us, I think, because I've known you all enough, is this, there's a, there's still a centering in each of us. There is what we, what I would call a, a moral compass. It just simply says, there's some things that you just, you just do, you just live, because that's who you are. It's just, it's just how you are defined. And so it is almost, it, it's, it's difficult not, you, you could, you, Neither of you could be in a comp in a position where you would not have compassion for someone else. That would not be in any of you in any situation or anything that you believe strongly about that you would not stand up for. I don't think either, either of you would ever be in a position where you'd kind of shrink away from that. And I think one of the things that and maybe that's why we're in the fields that we're in, because those are fields that require you to stand up. Mm -hmm. These are not, <laughs> you know, these are not occupations that say, I think I'll just wait and see what the wind, you know, how the wind blows. You know, you come in with a stand. You come in with a position. You come in with a sense of, you know, a sense of direction. Um, I was with my um, study group, my church study group the other week, and one of the things that came out that uh, Marty mentioned was in the darkest room, you bring the light. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking on that. It's like, yeah, you <laughs> in the darkest, I mean, even whether the dark room is your own personal trouble or tragedy, like you, you, you go to that faith, like you said, Radine, you go to that. There, mm -hmm. there is still that, I think that must be within each of you, yeah. you have it there, even though, I mean, you're not, you know, standing on the, you know, street corners or and standing in front of empty churches waiting 
holding a Bible upside down, but you are. <laughs> but you are, you're living your truth. And that is your, that is your light. And so it's just kind of how you, it's just kind of who you are. And I think that segues into the times that we're in now. We're two months and change away from what I think everybody would concede are some of the most important leadership choices in our lifetimes. And in my case, that's 74 years worth. Mm -hmm. So that's a bunch. Um, that far beyond. Yeah. <laughs> and, and your description fits into it really well, Sandra, because you've got one side saying the choices between dark and light. We've got the other side saying the choices between law and order or chaos and violence. Yeah, um, how do you see the choice that faces us, the leadership choices that face us? Redeem. Uh, you know, I, for me, it's a no brainer. I mean, I, I, I was thinking about it this morning. There were certain, uh, democratic candidates that I would have loved to been able to vote for. Um, and I'm not going to diss the ones who are, um, running right now. Um, but I, I, there's, for me, there's no choice. The choice is democracy. The choice, it's, and the thing with, um, I think, um, Trump is, it's not just what he's saying, but it's what he's doing. So, you know, he is trying to say the right things once in a great while. And even that, it's, you know, I, I just cannot understand how people who support him don't see that. Um, but I think, I guess for me, this election is, it's about holding on to hope even when it seems like it's very dim and it seems scary, like with the postal service and all of that. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of times I'm, I'm praying and I'm advocating for, you know, get your votes out and do what you can as a, as a citizen. You know, we need, we need people to, we need access and we need those of, those people who don't have access need to be supported. Mm -hmm. Bill, how do you see the choices we're looking at? Well, obviously these are very important choices, as you said, and um, it just so happens that I'm, this is my chapter of reading in the Bible is Ezekiel, and Ezekiel talks about leaders and what we, where mm -hmm. we have to look to in leaders and what leaders are gonna be held accountable for when they lead their flock, okay? So, you know, in the old days, as a Democrat, I would just vote the party, party lines. Um, I would not so much be concerned about a person's um, uh, particular position on things. I would assume that the Democrats were a certain way, the Republicans were a certain way. I didn't spend a lot of time delving into what really uh, they were like. Um, and, and so, but, but now that's a whole different uh, situation with me. I need to know uh, where they come from and I need to believe uh, where they're coming from is, is the truth. Uh, too many of our leaders are really concerned about the money aspect, um, protecting themselves, protecting others like them. Um, and that's, con you know, that, that, that's obviously concerning for me. Um, as a leader, your whole job being there is to um, basically protect, preserve, um, take care of your constituents, not be concerned about your friends, not be concerned about your pocket. Um, and that's really heightened in this election. So clearly I'm looking at the person that's going to be there. And number one, is gonna follow a constitution that, that was established by our country many, many years ago, courts of upholding, right? I want to know that that person is going to follow the constitution. That person is going to be concerned about us individually, um, how his constituents, how this nation is, is going in terms of um, equality in terms of um, financially, um, in terms of health care. Uh, we need someone who's going to be a leader, a real leader in those areas. And so that's, that's what I'm looking at. And it's simple for me, because as you, as you know, uh, the track record uh, establishes where this person's been, this person's going to be in the future. So clearly for me, uh, it's a no brainer that um, I'm going to pick those individuals that um, obviously 
are concerned about me as a person, concerned about me in terms of, um, you know, my friends, my family, uh, my community, and um, what we can anticipate and expect uh, uh, to be happening in my community and be happening to us. So it's a no brainer for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Sandra, what jumps out at you about the choices that we're facing? How do you see it? It is, for me, it's, it is, it's the leadership, yes, but it's also um, concern for the rule of law. That's a biggie for me. It's just, if we don't have that, and we don't have, a, 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 first off, an understanding of the underpinnings of our constitutional system, which you got to have that first. You got to understand it and know it and, and live it and advocate for it. And when it is violated, you have to be the one to speak up for it because you're the one that's holding these institutions, the responsible person for these institutions. And so that to me, I think the thing that gets me more is the, the disregard for the rule of law. And maybe it's just not even a disregard, it's just an ignorance of the rule of law. Um, I hope that maybe that's even better to be ignorant of it than to say you're just gonna know it and just mm -hmm. toss it to the side. I'm not sure which is worse. Um, but that to me is is very troubling because it, it stretches into everything else. It goes, you know, understanding it and acknowledging and protecting the rule of law goes into issues with regard to equality and, and racial justice and discrimination and you know voting rights and access and concern for communities and concern for people and concern for educating our children and concern for um, the environment. All of that is connected to understanding and, and, and enforcing the rule of law. And that to me is kind of where we are. And it's just something that I, that I, I feel very strongly about that. And that's kind of the determining factor for me. So this seems to be the first campaign in history where one of the parties has made a central element of its platform, what they're calling empathy, but not just empathy, but the courage and conviction to stand up for it, to assert it, to protect those who are deserving of the empathy. Mm -hmm. What role does that have now for you in what we're looking at? I think it's critical because our society, have, we have so many needs and we have so many things that are affecting people in, in, in such a way that they can't, they can't, they're not able to live the lives that we, we all expect to do. There's, there's, when you look at things like healthcare and certainly with COVID, I mean, it's just torn our families and communities apart. And if you can't empathize with that, and if you can't see that first, uh, as being the thing that we've got to look at and care about. If there are people who are just hurting on all kinds of levels. And if you can't feel that, if you can't, if you can't to speak to that, if you can't, you know, see a person in need and either just understand that, uh, what are you? What are you? So is there a connection between empathy and equality and where we need to go? Well, yeah. I think absolutely, absolutely there's a connection. Um, clearly, um, to empathize with, with someone is, is very simple. Is that is basically, as the Bible says, love your neighbor, okay? Mm -hmm. um, just as you would love yourself. So, you know, to empathize, you, you put yourself in the position of the other person. And so you put yourself on an equal plane with the other person when you yeah. empathize with that person. So there's clearly um, a sense of equality and a sense of justice uh, when you talk about empathy. So um, the one and, 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 and the other go hand in hand, clearly, when we talk about them. And so the, the individual leaders who are gonna really walk the, the walk and, and walk the talk, uh, who, who basically say, look, I empathize with you folks. Um, those are the people that we need to put put into leadership, it's clear to me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, I, I think there's more rage than in, there is engagement today. And I, I suspect that empathy would be a way to put a pause in between 
the choice between engaging with someone or raging against them. And um, it definitely is tied to the quality. I mean, if I'm so self-centered to the point of narcissism, I can't see anyone else but myself. And I put myself up on a pedestal that, you know, doesn't allow me to really care about anybody. And I find it interesting that um, empathy and a moral compass and the rule of law are essential to our essential focal point is presidential campaign. And um, I think we need to learn that the rule of law and a moral compass, the two can exist for too long, it's been divisive, you know? Yeah, and maybe there's an image that somehow connects the empathy and the equality. I'm thinking of Portland where when the wall of moms came out. Mm. And then after that, the wall of vets came out. Yes. Those are people that were out there in an extremely diverse group. And now that we come into about our last minute of this show, any, any last thoughts on what's most important about seeing and making our choices from here on out? Sandra? I think we do need to begin from that place of empathy and understanding and connecting with the people that, you know, that we are uh, in contact with and the people that we're responsible for. That has to that has to be critical because from that everything else flows as we just talked about. Okay, in our last minute, Brady, last thoughts. Uh, I would just say that I think it's really important, regardless of you know what our personal situations are, to also include the bigger picture and the long term. I think too often we think short term, microwave. You know, um, we got to think about this in the long term and what it's gonna look like for the next generation. Yeah. 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 Okay. And Bill, you're a defense attorney. Who do we most need to defend? <laughs> we need to defend those people who um, can't defend themselves is really what we need to defend. And I agree with both Sandra and Ray Dean as to what we need to do. And importantly for everyone out there, we have a democracy. And what's the, the thing that we have to do right now and make sure we do is vote. We need to get out there and vote. Uh, make your choices known. That's it. Thank you all. <clears throat> We've done another deep dive into things that we might not have anticipated in the beginning, but things that we really care about. And we hope that all of you care about as we see and make choices for humanity coming up in a couple of months. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.